Radio, your gamers roll. Roll for initiative. Greetings and welcome to the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is issue number 20. We finally made it to the 2-0 podcast. I am one of your hosts, DM Vincent, along with DM Jason and DM Nick. Jason, how are we doing this week? Hey there, doing great. How are you doing this week? Just wonderful. Uh, nice hot summery day, getting really hot in there in Pennsylvania. Nick, how are you doing back there? Um, trying to cool off just as much as everybody else here in the Buckeye State. So, yeah. but doing well, doing well. Looking forward to this week. Starting the, uh, hopefully a weekly uh, game with my kids every Thursday. Th- that uh, AD and D game that we uh, did on uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. So oh, your you camping trip. Yeah. Yeah, on the camping trip. So hopefully you're going to make that a weekly thing every Thursday afternoon. So cool. We'll see you, how it goes. You bought them books and everything. You were saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I bought them books a few months back. I got. I found uh, you know the uh, eighty three covers of the. Uh, Players' handbooks. I found like a half price books for like, like maybe three twenty five each. So nice. Pretty jazzed about it. Pretty cool. Oh, they got their first book from Dad to play a game with. That's awesome. Yeah. Continuing on the next generation. That's right. And yep. so we'll do real quickly because some people had asked uh, what our website rfipodcast.com dot uh, com rfi g rfi staff at gmail dot com. You can contact us with, or you can head to the Facebook site facebook dot com slash rfi podcast. We also want to uh, take a second to uh, acknowledge D20 Radio, and we thank them for sponsoring us on their network. You can go to d20radio.com for all the 19, 20, 22 podcasts they have on there about a variety of subjects. Uh, you want to podcast your name it, they probably have it there. They have any, every edition of D&D, including Pathfinder at this point. Well, wow. Yeah, if you want to go listen, uh, go take a shout out there and join the forums and listen to all the podcasts. Sounds like a plan, right? Sounds like it to me. And we'd also like to take a moment to thank all the people that have given us five-star reviews. Yay! Let's hand it over to Jason. Yes, thank you, everybody. Uh, So uh, just to kind of show our appreciation for that, I wanted to read a couple of the ones that are on here. Uh, Actually, pretty recently, Liam D.C. Bahoy said, I haven't played AD&D since the early 1990s. After opening up the old player's handbook just to have a look, I decided to look for podcasts dedicated to AD&D First Edition and found this gem. Now I'm definitely wanting to get into a First Edition game. Anybody in Northern Virginia interested? <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, all of our that. folks in Virginia. <laughs> yes. Uh, then we have one here from a week ago from Jakey Danger, who said, Roll for Initiative is by far the coolest podcast I've ever heard. Old school gamers need to check it out if they haven't already, and new school gamers should too to see how great real D and D is. Fear not the mighty Thacko. <laughs> um, and Duke Steel, who awesome. apparently has found out what my birth name was and adopted it for his own, <laughs> says it's super. Check it out if you like to role play, and even if you'd like to role play, spelling it with the L's and the E's, and. Uh, so I, I'll stop there because I'm. I, this, those are good. Those are great, and thank you everybody for saying the nice things. And we appreciate the five star reviews. Um, and I don't want to sound like we're uh, pimping for stars. So if you know if you don't like it, you're welcome to go and give any kind of review you want. But we like the five star ones especially. So yep. thanks. Well, yeah, you can obviously give us you know a <laughs> you four star a- review if you want. We'll yeah. accept four stars. Yeah, <laughs> even four and a half. You can't do that. So. <laughs> nice try, though. <laughs> but seriously, thanks everybody who's yes. Yes, doing thank it. You. It, really, so it helps a lot. It helps a lot. Yes. It just shows our uh, our listenership is growing and growing. It's just really cool how much we're reaching out to everyone. Yes, and let's head over to the sage advice section. Sage advice. Welcome to Sage Advice. So what do we have? Sage, <laughs> Sage Advice. That's right. Um, Nick, you want to take the but, first uh, section there? Yeah, yeah. Got a couple here. Um, 
I guess George writes in and he asks a couple of questions of us. And Hi, George. hello, George, Hi, wherever George. you are. <laughs> I wish my brother George was here. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> wah, wah. Anyway, one, he asks, uh, where can I find, if it exists, a master list of everything ever published, made for first edition AD&D? I have already have plenty of stuff. I want to begin working on my collection towards the end goal of having as near to all of it as possible. Well, George, excellent question. And I have an answer for you. There's a really good website, and I've been using this one for years and years. Um, and see if I pronounce it correctly. It's uh, acaeum.com, www.acaeum.com. And they have a concise, complete list of everything first edition AD&D. All the modules, all the books, all the accessories that were ever out. So it's a good one-stop shopping place. At least they get a concise list of everything. And, you know, if you're a completist like I'm trying to be now, uh, that's a good place to go. Uh, so again, Yeah. Does that I haven't actually I've I've been to that site before but I didn't go recently. Does is it just the TSR stuff that they list? Just TSR. Okay. If you're looking for, yeah, if you're talking about like Judges Guild, mm-hmm. I think they delved into that a little more. From my understanding, I've someone's seen... trying to science, someone's trying to do a Judges Guild list too. Yeah, I've seen some lists that are out there. Um cover and Rollades was always one of my favorite publishers yes. as well. Um, yes. And, you know, now that we're saying this, I probably should have looked up beforehand because when I was at Gen Con last year, I met some people who were putting together a book that was going to do exactly this, a uh, collector's guide to all mm. AD&D materials. Oh, wow. And, um, and actually it was really good because they I, – I talked to them. I have a couple of the old uh, hobby shop catalogs. I don't know if you remember the hobby shop, which was – Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which was TSR's actual um, catalog order. So I gave yeah. them some scans of that. And uh, here we go, the mail order hobby shop. So they are, uh, let's see, gamers, Debbie Hunt and Gamers Rule. They are putting together a catalog, but I can't find the name of exactly what it is. So I'll try to find out and put something on the website. But cool. Anyway, well, I, this I know is a that good there's start. a book yeah. out so if, yeah, a good start would be a cam dot com, and we'll put the and in fact, I think on our website I do have a link to them. If uh, I could double check here, real good. quick, I'm pretty sure that we do have a link to a cam dot com. So let's see if I could if pull not, that we'll up. If not, we'll put it up on the site. Yeah, in fact, do do do. Yes, they are. They're there. They're look under first edition AD and D resources on the on the uh, main page, and it's right there. They can. Okay. So there you go. Well, bam. And then um, his other question was uh, one of our podcasts that we had in the past. You heard us talking about old uh, cardboard cutout minis. I used to have some of these, but don't remember who made these. Or who made them? Could you guys point me in the right direction? Well, fear not, George. <laughs> uh-huh. I have an answer for you. Um, it was Cardboard Heroes by Steve Jackson Games. And I just went there recently onto the, on the Steve Jackson Games website, and they have a concise list of everything they ever published, going back even to the early 80s now. And they have it listed to where alphabetically... Um, you know, stuff that's either still in print or it's uh, available digitally or out of print or coming soon. So if you look up uh, under car- under C for Cardboard Heroes, right now the Dungeon 4 plans are still in print and the fantasy sets for all the different uh, characters and monsters like orcs, goblins, what have you, those are now available for download as, as uh, PDFs, I believe. So Excellent. they are available. Uh, before they weren't, because I bought my set like years ago, and it was like out of print after that. So now they have those fantasy sets available again for PDF. So if you want to make a massive amount of works for an army, boom, there you go. So there you go. Check out Steve Jackson Games uh, there, George, and they'll have it and, for you. And uh, 
I, I just did find that book that I was trying to find about. It's it is the website is gamers dash rule dot com. So gamers rule gamers dash rule dot com, oh, cool. and they have just come out with a book called the ultimate unofficial collector's guide to D and D. So uh, it's it's fifteen bucks on their website, and it covers everything going back to chainmail and the first box sets. Uh, the first it says here the first volume goes all the, from chainmail and the first box sets all the way through the classic D and D put out in large boxes in the nineties, um, along with all the modules produced for basic D and D. The thunder. It looks like actually this one might be only for D and D. I think they're getting ready to do an. Oh, the, the second volume has a D and D. There we go. So there's oh, two oh, volumes. Okay. First volume is OD and D. The second volume goes AD and D, cool. and it actually follows it all the way up through 3.5. So somebody that's interested in the whole continuum, uh, they look like really cool books. So if anybody gets one, let us know how they are. Yeah, yeah, let us know how they are. Give us a review. And if you do buy one from any, if you buy anything from uh, somebody you hear about on the podcast, please do us a favor and let them know uh, where you heard about them. We're not getting anything for it, but you know, it always helps for people to know that we're here in case someday we want to go and say hello. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we're not going to not going to get any free swag or anything, but you know, it, I guess it's nice to be acknowledged. It could happen in the future, you never know. <laughs> never know. Okay. Uh and I think George has one more question left. Uh he's talking about trying to find local groups in his area. Yeah. In the tri-state area. And yep. he wanted to know of any suggestions that can help him out. Well, I know one big suggestion is called meetup.com. There's uh, quite a few uh, D&D type based groups on there, people that meet in local areas. There's one for my area. I'm sure there's one for his area as well. You just sign up there, put in your name and your zip code and everything, and they'll find. And you put in D&D and you'll find probably a, a plethora of groups. Cool. Yeah, I'm not sure um, when he says tri-state area, that's a pretty big Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty big area. I mean, if you're here in uh New York City, George, uh drop me a line. You know, so Yeah, cuz you're uh, talking I'm what? Actually New trying York, to New Jersey and Connecticut, right? When you're talking tri-state area, right? Pennsylvania. I would assume. I mean, that's what I usually think. Or No, I think okay. isn't tri-state New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania? Well, Connecticut's closer, so yeah, I don't know. I've, Whatever. I don't know. But either way, I mean, it's it's pretty far to go if he's, you know, in, you know, low in like southern New Jersey or something. So, but but whatever. It, it, maybe uh, some people who are listening to the podcast, if there's anyone who's in the area that wants to go on to the Roll for Initiative Facebook site or to the RFIPodcast.com, uh, you know, go ahead and organize some stuff. Just put your there name you up there and see if you can find anybody. Sounds good. Nice segue I, of plugging the website. I like it. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Actually, doesn't uh, D20, the D20 radio forums and maybe Dragon's Foot have some looking for games? Dra- Dragon's Foot does. Yes. I know that. I've seen it. Dragon's Foot has a looking for players forum. Yep. You betcha. Yep. And I would, I would, I would uh, recommend checking out D20 uh, forums as well. You know, obviously, yep. since that's our network. So. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to go on to our next question by DM Keith, and uh, I'll read this one. And Jason, you're going to be the one to answer this one. So, Am I? Uh-oh. Yeah, you're on the spot here, buddy. Uh, oh, I want to try my hand at writing a short article. Do we have a list of... I lost my paper here. A list Desired of... topics or Thank articles. Yes. yes, that he can submit, and is there any guidelines for submitting it? Um, okay, so I'll start with the guidelines, and I'm going to use... The talk about the guidelines, first of all, as a little bit of an apology to some of the writers uh, that we have right now, because we have uh, Todd Hughes and DM Bill, and uh, I'm making sure I get everybody listed here. We have uh, Matt Ide, or Ide, I'm not sure, and PC Buzz. So um, when people submit uh, stories to the website, I have to go and proofread them, make sure that they're in decent shape uh, before we can put them up. So I'm not always the fastest at that <laughs> because you know, I've, a lot, I've got a lot of good stuff going on, but that's no excuse. Um, so first of all, by way of apology, um, I'm sorry that it takes me a while to proofread those, but that kind of leads me to the guidelines if you want to write for the website. What would be really the best is if you're a good proofreader of your own material. And I don't mean spell check because... Spellcheck doesn't catch things. I mean, it doesn't can't catch homonyms. It can't catch 
uh, punctuation and, and, and grammatical oddities. So I really, really appreciate it. The, the, uh, the more uh, carefully proofread something can be, if you have a friend that can do it, the faster I can get it up on the site because then I can just sort of eyeball it and say, okay, up it goes. Um, we're still working out how to make tables work properly because being an AD&D website, obviously tables are going to come up all the time. And of course. And our published blog publishing software doesn't make that too easy, and I'm working on that. So aside from that, as far as uh, things we might be looking for or guidelines, I think something that would be really great is uh, articles about campaign settings and adventure settings, uh, things that people can really use in terms of practical stuff. Uh, we have a good article coming up from Todd soon uh, called You Know My Marcanius City, where he's uh, talking about one of his settings. And uh, I think those things can be really good. We Todd's been doing some uh, ecology of type articles. I mean, really, if there's anything that you think would just be uh, interesting to write, the guidelines we kind of look for are the sort of things that you might expect to see in a Dragon magazine, you know, from the 80s. So, yeah. So when it comes to the email, when they email the uh, RFI staff at gmail.com, do you want them just to send an article in so you can just glance over and then you'll work, you'll you contact them back? Uh, yeah, or, you know, even just a, uh, a – if, if they don't have a complete article written yet, uh, just kind of say what it is you're interested in writing, and I will uh, get back to you with a login for the website so you can post things, and then I'll go through and – uh, you know, proofread to publish it. And if I haven't read the article before, I mean, if we've never seen your writing or anything, don't be offended if we choose not to go with it because just because we give a login, it's just the easiest way to get the stuff up. You know, not everybody has exactly what we're looking for. It doesn't mean they're not good writers or whatever. It just, you know, might not be appropriate for a first edition site. But, um, you know, put something up and, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about it. Sweet. That sounds like a plan. Okay, we have one last email left. Jason, you want to take that last email? Okay, so the last one looks like it comes from Emil Larson. And uh, he writes in and, uh, oh, well, he challenges us to say his name correctly. So um, I hope that I've said Emil Larson properly. And if I haven't, he can let us know. He says, greetings from the <laughs> cold country. <laughs> greetings from the cold country of Sweden. So I was listening to issue 19 and thought I should share my way of doing NPCs. Right now, my group is playing over Skype. Nice. Um, nice. So I just do most of the dialogue in character. When we play around a table, however, I act, a lot, I act out a lot, at least with large hand gestures. So. Cool. Excellent. So you just like I like it. Show. Yeah. We're reaching all the way out to Sweden, to the Vikings. I love it. <laughs> Boy. And uh, wait, didn't we say Spain also? And Spain. Oh, yeah, we just got an email. Mm -hmm. Just just came in recently from Nacho. Coming from, hey, Nacho. Hey, Nacho from Spain. He says, hey, DMs. He, uh, he loves first edition himself. Uh, he mostly got started playing with basic D&D &D or second edition. He said that first edition never got translated back in the day for over, I guess, in his country. Uh, so he wanted to know, I guess, Nick, you probably the best person, which module, official or available on the net, would you recommend for a short three to four session adventure and what level? I want to put the fear of bizarre and unpredictability of deaths back into my players. By the way, no Tomb of Horrors. We did that in second edition. <laughs> enjoy the well. <laughs> keep up the great, excellent show. I really enjoy the podcast. Well, thank you so much, Nacho, from coming from all the way there in the Iberian Peninsula, or the yes, <laughs> yeah. all the way there in Spain. So, uh, and that levels for he was looking for third to fifth. You were saying? Mm, yeah, I just said a short three to four session adventure. And what level would yeah. you recommend? I guess. Oh, and what level? Mm, I would say a one that would be good short adventure, you know, just a standard dungeon crawl, um, three to four sessions. I think White Plume Mountain's a good choice. Uh, nice. Fifth to seventh levels. Uh, it's got a little bit of everything in there. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to hear a review from Blackstone's Vault on that. But uh, just throwing that out there, that's a real good one off the top of my head. That would be. 
that you can do in probably like mm. three to four sessions. Secret of Bone Hill. Secret of Bone Hill, another good one. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I would say, and that one's more of a sandbox type, mm -hmm. but I think, and that's like levels two to four coming off the top of my head on that one. Yeah, uh, I was going to say one to part three. Of the yeah, part of the Lendor Isle series. Uh, and uh, excellent module. And that one's, uh, I would say you could do three to four se sessions, but you could also stretch it out a little bit on that one. But um, maybe um, maybe even Ghost Tower of Inverness might be a good one as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say those three. That's a good place to start, and you can always check uh, dragonsfoot.org. I think there's a couple that uh, might be good for a couple sorts, uh, uh, you know, sessions of three to four uh, meetings. So I'll in, tell in you usual, one, yeah. one suggestion I might make is a more recently published module also called the uh, Curse of the Witch's Head, which is Ooh. from uh, um, Ex Expeditious Retreat Press. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good, I would say it's probably a two or three session uh, one, and I, I'd have to check the levels, but I think it's for around third to fifth level. Um, really, really good, really, really great module. And is he saying that he was uh, going to just have the uh, players jump in at that level? Maybe create their characters at that at that level? He doesn't actually say. He just wanted suggestion for. Uh, he pretty much wants an old school feeling. Well, I was just going to suggest that if he's uh, looking to do that, there's finding you know as far as getting the uh, giving them some characters to get started with as well. Uh, if you can find some Judges Guild materials, um, whether it's through one of the companies like Troll and Toad or on eBay, if you can find a way to pick up fantastic personalities, um, I use, I'm actually using it for our little encounter today, and it's one of the best, uh, you know, just quick, I need a character of a certain level with lots of background, really richly written, interesting characters as well. So you might try to find that old Judges Guild book, Fantastic Personalities. Yeah, I forgot about those at mm -hmm. Exped Expeditious Retreat Press. I have a couple of those. I'm trying to remember one. There's a, was it the Podmaster Sister Shroom or something like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Yeah. It's like a levels two to four, and that's a really good one, too, to try out. But, uh, yeah, go to yeah, Expeditious Retreat Press. Just type it in on, on any browser search engine. You can find it. So, and those guys, I mean, it's it's a small company of of uh, gamers that are really committed to the game and to to putting out really high quality stuff. Incredibly nice people, really care about their customers. So, yep. you yep. know, it's, it's it's worth throwing some business over there. Ah, uh, yes, the Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom. That's what it's called. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Nice. It was a weird name. I'm like, yeah, I have that one. It's very really cool. I hope to use that one uh, in my the campaign I'm using with my kids. So. Okay. Oh, we got this uh, surprise. Like this. I looked in the email, and here's another email. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Hey. This one is from Doug. Doug says, I love the podcast. I never did first edition myself. Got into AD&D second edition in college. That's okay, Doug. We forgive you. Never <laughs> really got into third edition or fourth edition. And he wants to know, he has two questions for us. Have you folks ever gone over any first edition retro games in your podcast, like uh, Swords and Wizardry, Osric, or Labyrinth Lord? Yes, we have. He's like, I no, may have no. missed them. I think we did that way back, Jason. Now, you and I did that, like, maybe third or fourth episode, I think. Yeah. Something um, like that. We should, we should uh, actually try to find out what that is so we can say it here. But it, the, you can still listen to this show by going to, um, going to RFIPodcast.com. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see all the past RFI issues there. And mm -hmm. I don't know which one it is. We've got a primer on old school gaming, where to find first edition books. Um, who did we have on that was a publisher of uh, one um, of the, uh, uh, the Matthew Finch? Yes. So maybe if we find the Matthew Pinch Finch <laughs> show, that would be the one to listen to for that kind of thing. And he did go Try over Osric and Sword and Wizardry pretty heavily. Yes, I don't he think did. we did in the Lord Labyrinth Lord though. Uh, or no. Castles and Crusades, if that's another one I think off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I don't we know. Can always... was... You can also yeah. go yep. to uh, Facebook and listen to all the old shows if you don't feel like downloading them, but we'd rather yeah. you just go straight to the website. 
And, and that's something maybe we might want to do for another episode, maybe go into a little more detail on some of those things so people can, you know, see what else is out there, too, that's like, you know, first edition AD&D, and if they can't get the books, they can get something real close, you know? His last yep. question is, also, do you know if there's any second edition retro clone games out there? My search comes up empty. Keep up the good work, hmm. Doug. I that's haven't heard of any. I well, if anybody um, who's listening to the show knows about any, please go and uh, leave a message on rfipodcast.com so that we can, uh, you know, let them know. Best yeah. place to look would be dragonsfoot.org with their second edition forums, or was it Knights and Knaves? Alehouse? Um, they're more first edition. I would say probably dragonsfoot.org might be the best bet if you want to look for anybody who might be creating a second edition AD&D retro clone. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's going to wrap up Sage Advice for this week, unless you guys have any closing comments. No, it's I just... have no idea when he was on the show. Look at this. I can't find it on our website. <laughs> we need to fix it. <laughs> we don't know our Yeah, own. get on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we'll post it up in the show notes yeah. then let's head into the dragon's whore the dragon's horde so with the wonderful dragon's horde this week what do we got uh, oh, uh, we got a custom magic item sent in yes from our first one I think Yes, actually, it is our first one. It's, it is coming from Crispin, our young listener, who uh, got his stuff from his grandfather, if you remember from last episode. Yes, very cool. Yes, he said his grandfather made this up for his character, and he sent it in to us, so sort of no return. He, uh, he said this is a blade made of bone with grooves that run down the blade, channeling the blood into the stones that appear to be red rubies, called bloodstones. The blade is covered in runes, and the handguard is shaped in a pair of obsidian claws. Ooh, sounds kind of cool. The blood yeah. zones are the source of the blade's magical powers and draw the power from blood, which must be replenished regularly. If the blood stones are not fed, and he put the fed in uh, quotes there, at least once a month, it will lose one plus of magical ability per month that it goes unused. The sword of no return is always hungry to well, is always hungry to be wielded in battle, and will seek to control its owner to ensure its constant feeding. Ooh, sounds like an <laughs> ego intelligence weapon. Hmm. On a natural 20 to hit, the sword drains two levels of spectre. Ooh. Any creature Yikes. killed by the sword has its soul absorbed by the blade. It cannot be resurrected or brought back to life by a raised dead or directly worded wish spell. Wow. Yeah. It's considered a short sword, plus two to hit, plus five to damage if used within the past month. It detects good. I guess this is made for an evil character. <laughs> mm, <laughs> detect, it, yeah, detect good, evil, 60-foot radius. Detect invisibility, 10-foot radius. Detect magic, 30-foot radius. It has an intelligence of 17, an uh -huh. ego of 16, and an alignment of chaotic evil. Really? It, yeah. <laughs> it speaks common, and it has the ability with telepathy with the wielder. So, thoughts. So, uh, this um, is, first of yeah. all, Jason, let, me, go ahead. let me just make a couple of uh, caveats on here. And Crispin, you may notice that this is not the exact wording that you sent in. We, I did go through and uh, do a quick little bit of edit for um, publishing out onto the show. So, um, just because we wanted to have the wording, uh, you know, something that we felt like you know, reading out here. But I did actually make a little bit of my own tweaking here. So, I hope that that's okay with you, Crispin. I apologize. I do want to point out which it was so that we don't miscredit uh, anything that you've done. Um, the bloodstones and the blood flowing down into the hilt were uh, original parts of this, and uh, I was trying to understand well, what would be the, you know, the, the, the meaning of doing this sort of thing. So that's I added in the bit about making sure that the bloodstones are fed at least one per, once per month. Oh. So if you were to find one of these, or uh. not one of these, this, it sounds like a unique item. If you were to find yeah. this sword um it would l not likely be you know on its own it would always be doing whatever it could to attract a new wielder to go out and get it these souls and get it the swords or get it this uh blood um and also the uh it's he said in there that the sword if you're killed by the sword uh you cannot be raised by any means whatsoever and so i was trying to think about what exactly 
that would mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, it would be the soul being. I was thinking, is it like a sphere of annihilation? Is it like a, uh, you know, a, a nine lives stealer? What sort of thing is it? And so the soul would be absorbed by the blade, and you wouldn't be able to be resurrected or brought to life. But I did say. You doesn't. You wouldn't be able to use a directly worded wish spell. So, in other words, um, we talked in the past about using wishes. Yes. This would be the sort of thing where you couldn't simply wish the person back to life because the soul's been in there. Maybe the gods don't have the power to do that or whatever. But you might find a way to word your wish spell differently. Whether it's turning back time so that this had to happen in the first place or something else. Just I wanted to give some clarity to that. Well, um, reading up on the sort of no return by uh, by Crispin, who said, and by the way, really cool magic item that your that your grandfather may uh, came up with. This I'm reading about it, and I'm thinking, this is like Stormbringer's lesser known cousin, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and and I'm thinking, this is a type of weapon, and Jason brought this up. It's a. I think it's a unique item. Mm. This is something along the lines. Again, if you're familiar with White Plume Mountain, like Black Razor or White Elm or something like that, this is this is a magic item. At least approaching how I would use it in a campaign or in a game, this would be like the goal of a, of a quest to get. And depending on the group that you would have, how I would run it, if you had a mostly, you know, good group, this might be a weapon that you would want to recover say, you know, maybe there's a race against time. Maybe you and one other group that's maybe evil is trying to get this one all-powerful sword, the Sword of No Return, and you have to get it before the evil party gets it. Or maybe some sort of evil ruler, or maybe a, it's a, maybe a Death Knight has this sword, and you have to, you're on a, on a quest to defeat the Death Knight and get the sword and destroy it, or something of that nature. Just some, some campaign ideas how I would use this particular item, you know, in one of my games. So that's how I was kind of looking at it. I could think of really cool ways of putting this into my campaign. I, more than likely, I will use it sometime in the future. What level would you say this would be around? Oh my gosh. Um, um, Probably thinking about eighth, ninth level or higher. Yeah. Probably around there, eighth through tenth level. I was just thinking about maybe seven, maybe the lowest yeah. seven. Yeah, seven or higher. Yeah, but I, I like the whole idea of like a, a quest, either surrounded to get the sword so another group won't get it, or maybe a quest to destroy it, something like that. Or if you're an evil, we have mostly evil party. Maybe your quest is to get it and wreak havoc across the across the world. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever trips your trigger. Yeah, I was looking at this. I'm like, this is really, really cool looking sword and has a really cool yeah. looking ability. Is thinking, I don't know if I want this in my game though, because it's going to bring a little more trouble than it's worth. Maybe I don't know. But uh, I'd like to see more of what Crispin's grandfather has done with uh, magical weapons, because it seems like he has the. Uh, the really creative mind going on for him there with evil items, so I kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And um, yeah, I think we need more stuff like that. You know, I think it brings a lot more to the game. So I'm interested to hear what Crispin's grandfather had too, and anybody else that they have yeah. some original magic items that they put into their campaigns, uh, either something as powerful as this or something rather, you know, mundane. Uh, we yeah. will definitely take a look at them and your chances are they'll end up on the podcast or on the website and uh yeah send them in i think that's a good it's idea i think we should uh in maybe going forward if someone wants to submit a custom magical item for the uh, dragon's horde we will uh take a look at it and see if we maybe we can do a review on it i mean yeah if oh absolutely you never know i mean we won't we won't, as Jason will usually says, uh, we're not going to hold back. No, he doesn't usually say oh, that. Of course but... not. No, of course <laughs> we're going to be we're honest. Is what back. he usually says. That's what Jason always says. Be honest. I never say any of that. Yes, I know. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, what do you think about that, Jason? Someone submitting a magical item in the future, and we try to review it like we did here. I think that'd be really cool if we get enough people doing them. I'd love to uh, put a few of them up on the site and let people kind of vote for which one we want to uh, bring up on the show. Um, but for right now, let's just get some in. So people, please please send yours in. 
yeah. definitely. Yeah, because you know, like all of us, if you've been, you know, gaming as long as we have, or you know, not long at all, I'm sure I know I have them. The past sit there's like, well, I have all these books and have all the magical items. What can I make up on my own? What would be really cool to make? And you have all this wealth of information you made for yourselves. Now here's an opportunity to bring it out. Yes, show us your creative dark side. Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll end this and we'll go right into table manners tonight. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world, I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. So for table manners tonight, we actually have a fun little hobby that a lot of people like doing, and you could probably hear it in the background there. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> yes, this is called dice collecting. How much is way too much? Never. <laughs> well, I think the first topic we have here is: uh, Does a person really need that much dice? <laughs> do you really uh, need to come to the table with that much dice? No, you do not. Yes. No, no, yes, no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm tired of people coming to my table with two pounds worth of dice. No. I know. I hate that. I mean, seriously, if you're going to bring dice, bring enough. Two pounds is weak sauce. Oh, God. <laughs> well, if it gets to the point where you have to take out a small loan to go buy dice, I think you might have a problem. But <laughs> other than that, do you really need that many? I don't know. I mean, I think it depends. If if you've gotten, if you had to go searching for a special dice bag because none of the ones that they sold at the hobby shop could hold your dice, then yeah, maybe you're carrying too many with you. <laughs> well, there's always those cool Crown Royal bags. Yes, that's true. <laughs> you know, those hold a lot. <laughs> or you could uh, get one of the the great bags, like uh, one of my players, also named Jason. Uh, that we bought for him at Gen Con last year, which was a, a bright pink bag with unicorns and hearts all over it. Whoa. Oh, God. Nice. <laughs> we make him well, bring it every game. <laughs> I have my friend Frank. He uh, makes chain mail, uh, and he does sell it. He makes chain mail dice bags, and they're pretty cool looking. So yeah. he'll do, do custom stuff. But uh, my dice, my friend Jeff, I talked about him in the past, who's the, uh, you know, the uh, Dragonlands fanboy. Yes. He made a box for my dice to be put in. It was before That's I cool. went to Yeah, it was before I went to Iraq and he gave me this box he made and and I have the box right here you can hear me opening it up and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's got foam on the top and bottom of it and it holds probably about oh, I could probably hold about, you know, 12 Maybe fifteen different sets of dice in there. Wow! wow. And that's all. That's I all. I thought you were really saying fifteen dice, not 15 yeah. sets. No, fifteen different sets. And uh, I love it. I I've been using it for like you know six seven years now. And on the top of the box, I have all my uh, skull stickers. You know, of all the PC kills that have been made to me, and when I was a DM, so nice. that's pretty cool. I actually, it's funny because I was. Last time I was at a truck stop, I noticed that if you go into the right section of a truck stop, the, the some of the merchandise they have there is incredibly similar to the stuff that you'll find in a gaming store. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know how I felt about that as I was looking at all of the uh, dragon ashtrays and skull uh, boxes and stuff. But there were some – I have to admit there were some pretty cool carved wooden boxes at the uh, Sap Brothers truck stop. So. Crossing of uh, of subcultures there. You never know. Truckers and gamers. And and metalheads. So <laughs> There you go. Well, there you go. There's a trifecta right there. I think um, one of the coolest boxes uh, that you can get are the ones that are the dice towers as well. I, yeah. I, I don't... I, it doesn't matter. You can roll your dice just fine and randomly on your own, but it's pretty fun to drop them through the little dice tower. Yeah. <laughs> I remember... Now, going on the opposite part of the spectrum here, I know people that have gone completely diceless. I remember the dragon bone. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, the dragon long, magazine. it looked like one of those, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the game that it looked like. It looked like, uh, From like Master Dark Tower Mind. game? It looked like a game of Master. Master. Yeah. But uh, I've actually, that's funny because I've, 
the uh, I've got a Dragon magazine open here for something we're doing later, and I actually have an ad for it in this in this magazine. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. See, I remember those, and now you can get online randomizers and all that stuff. But I like having the dice. I, mean, I yeah, no fun. Well, for one thing, they're not random. I mean, you cannot have a, a true randomization coming out of a computer, no matter how random. Well, not like yeah. my dice that good either, but I. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. This is sorry, I was just flipping through here and I was gonna make sure that we talked about game science dice. Yeah. The uh precision dice. Mm. And I'm looking at this issue from December nineteen eighty one and there's a full page uh, advertisement for game science showing how they're precise unlike the other dice. So I guess they've been around well, longer than I thought. Yeah, game science has been around a long time. In fact, yeah, I remember they were I have a I think uh, the Best of Dragon Volume 1 I have, there's advertisement for game science, and that was like back in 80, 81. So. Yeah. But well, I do have one pet peeve about dice. I don't like it when players don't bring their dice, and I had one player like that. Hmm. Always forgot to bring his dice to the game. It drove me nuts. Well, I'm that's like, why you bring so many. That's why no. you bring, you know, that's why I have about six sets that are Call in my deck. superstitious, but I don't let people borrow my dice. Yeah, what, about the people that, what about people that, like, don't bad touch karma. my dice? Bad dice yeah. karma. <laughs> don't touch my dice, those type of people. You can have, like, 20 pounds of dice, but if you touch one of them, that's the end of the dice. Nah, well, I'm not like that. I'll let people borrow mine, so... I have yeah. a friend, I have my, one of my friends in my group, if you touch any of his dice, that's he, that's, he practically throws it out. He goes wow. through this whole ritual with his dice. Yeah, I won't even go. I'm not going near that one. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, my favorite dice to roll are, you know, the metal ones. I really like my metal ones. But when it comes to actually playing, if I need to make sure that, you know, some that I have any idea that the game's going right, I, I do prefer to use the game science. I've got a glow-in-the-dark set and an orange set that um, I have to admit you can actually tell the difference. You know, you always have the dice. You're like, that's my high rolling dice. That's my low rolling dice. But it's true. Um, mm -hmm. They they can tend to get a little bit weighted and uh, inaccurate. So I do like, even though when I use the accurate dice, I notice that a lot more rolls sometimes go against me because I was, you know, the real randomness. But but they're really enjoyable. So I like those. Do you Although take I, a fa oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, no, why don't no, you take ahead. a second and explain a little bit more detail with the game science dice and where you can get those. So for some people who don't understand that. Out okay, there. sure. So um, the the thing about the way the dice are made is that they're 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 cut off of a sprue, mm -hmm. like a mod, like if you were looking at a uh, a, a model airplane kit okay. or something. You know, you've got those little bits that come off. And when they yeah. do that, when they come off of the sprue, there's a little bit where it broke off. You know, just like again like a model airplane wing when you break it off and you with your making if you're making a model race car or whatever you have to file down that bit and what most mm -hmm. uh dice manufacturers do because they're making a lot of dice is they take those dice off the sprue and they throw them in a vat and two things go on i don't know if they go on at the same time or if they do it at separate times but uh they roll them all around like in a rock tumbler and that's how they get the uh the edges off the sprue mm -hmm. breaks off and they also just kind of throw all the paint on all at once as well so so what you get is a a die that has been rolled like it was in a rock tumbler and had paint thrown on it so there's no real precision to um where there was more or less paint or and and the edges get really rounded down so what game science does is they break them off the sprues. They do not, um, they don't roll them or do any of that or, or whatever. They don't tumble them. So every one of their dice has a little nub where you can see that it was broken off the sprue and incredibly sharp edges. So you can tell it's never been rock tumbled. And they come, the, uh, it's, it's the, the plastic is the color of whatever the plastic was. They don't paint them. And they will hand ink the uh, the numbers on them, so that when you get them, you usually get them with with no uh, ink on them, and you have to do them yourself with a pen. Or if you catch these guys at a game store, they'll do it for you there. Um, and the result is that they are they're they're evenly weighted, and they're guaranteed to be random. And I we actually sat down and you know like dorks rolled <laughs> you know a bunch of 20 side it's over and over again and saw the difference and it's true they they really are more random cool 
And so. you can you can buy them anywhere online. Uh, yeah, I think I, I I wouldn't know right off the top of my head who has them, but Game Science they're really easy to Google. Yeah, and okay. I think they show up at every convention. Um, the one thing though with Game Science they do make a few. Who's rolling the dice? Or That's me. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, they do make a few that are kind of specialty. I don't want to call them novelty dice, but they're not your standard. You know, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, twenty. Uh, they also make um, a three-sided, a five-sided, a seven-sided. Um, and so they're kind of weird polygons, and the, I wouldn't use those for accuracy because we tried them out, and like the five-sided, it's not really random. Uh, and, and I think they they make one called the D anything, which is it looks it looks kind of like a, a dodecahedron, and <laughs> you roll it, and it's that one dice. The way that they've done it, it can actually be a D four or a D one hundred or a D twenty or whatever you want it to be, um, which is kind of cool. And it's it's fun to get. I, I actually I've got another set, another pair here, that are um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Base twelve. What's base twelve called? Um, hexadecimal. Yeah. So yeah, I have a pair of hexadecimal dice, which have you know they go up to FF. Oh my um, gosh. Wait, no, it's not base twelve. That's base sixteen. I'm sorry, base sixteen goes up to FF, and uh, those are awesome because then if I need to quickly <laughs> generate a random RGB color for a website. Yeah, I mean, no, I no purpose other than that. But I like having them. So, hey Vince, is there any like favorite dice that you uh, particularly use? Uh, any particular brand? No particular brand. Uh, I usually I have my one set of uh, orange. They're like kind of an uh, orangey color with black specks in them, and mm-hmm. it has uh, gold for the letter uh, numbering. And those are usually my best dice to roll. But <laughs> I had for the longest time my group a player that kept rolling twenties on me. Right, and I couldn't figure oh it God. out. And this is the same guy that wouldn't let you touch his dice. So obviously, this is the reason coming up why I found that uh, he had a cheater die. What? Yeah, he had a he had a die that had three twenties on it. No, oh, he, he scoured that's like the, the lamest way yeah, I know. To cheat ever. He I mean, scoured the internet and found <laughs> what is called a cheater die, and he and it had three twenties on it, and he bought it and didn't tell anyone and. He just mixed it in with his dice and pretended to use it on random. And I'm like, dude, you're no longer allowed to use that dice. That's really not cool. <laughs> that I mean, scum. How is that any fun to for him either? I mean, I get yeah. it. It's fun to roll a natural 20, but you got to feel kind of like an idiot when you're sitting there going, oh, natural 20, and you know it's not a natural 20. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, you just, I mean, how is that fun? If there's no chance to – if you don't have a chance to die, then – it's not a game anymore. Now then, it's just racking up points or something. Yeah, you know, whatever. But I did have in my former group when I lived in Connecticut, this one guy. He was from I forget where the foreign country is, Croatia. No, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. he was part okay. of the Coast Guard uh, uh, exchange program. He was a Coast Guard over here, we're at the uh, at the Coast Guard Academy up here in Connecticut, right. and uh, uh, Groton, Connecticut, or was it New London, whatever. And he was, every time we played, he would roll 20s nonstop. I mean, like, every other roll, 20, 20. He'd be like, wow. boom, 20, boom, 20, like that. And we were like, yeah, okay. So we kept giving him dice, thinking maybe his dice were fixed. And he would mm-hmm. take our dice and roll 20s with it. And, well, he didn't have a special way or, like, a cheater roll or something. He just rolled, and he always got a 20 somehow. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> he wow. just had a magic touch with dice, and he would always laugh because he'd be like, 20, 20, 20. And he did it. I heard I'm, those I'm actually, Eastern Europeans have a special way. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm actually exact. I'm, I'm exactly the same way, except I always roll a one. Oh wow! So I had a set like that. I don't <laughs> use anymore. Uh, you know the the big oversized sets that you can get. I have a red set of those. Never oh, yeah, use yeah. them again. Never, never, never. Because I was always rolling like ones for fumbles or failed saves. And it was always when I DM for my group. I'm like, never, ever again. Because <laughs> of that set. So, but um, some of my favorite companies, I like, um, I haven't used Game Science, but I like Chessex. I, I like was Chessex. afraid you were going to say Chessex. Really? <laughs> I like I do. Well, they look I cool, do. but they're the Chessex are the ones that I always end up. They're always weighted. Um, one way or the I've other. never yeah. found that. I've never found that problem. I I always thought they always had cool promotions at conventions. You can do the mug of du- mugo dice. Yep. You always there's always a huge gaggle of people around their 
around their booth where you can get the big mug o dice. They and if you go on eBay, they got the bag o dice that you can buy, and it's mm -hmm. like completely random stuff out of their stock. But still, if you're going for an economical way, Chessex is really good, and I also like Crystal Cast. And okay. uh, they become a recent favorite of mine in the past few years because uh, they do these special um, dice for Origins and Gen Cons, the commemorative box sets, Crystal oh, Castle. Cool. Those. And I've been collecting those since like 2004 for mm -hmm. Origins. And every year when I get dice, that's the only time I get dice is I get the commemorative sets now. But uh, Crystal Cast is a really good one, too. In fact, I think they're the ones that also make dice out of precious stones. Oh, and yeah. So that's the one other thing. I mean, before we take the dice talk too long, but I didn't <laughs> want to miss out on things like, sure, there's precious stones and the bone dice, which are kind yes. of fun to get. Although they're usually really small. And I don't know if the very um, tiny dice are very uh, random at all since they're yeah so in fact they have uh, their latest deal I think is now they have dice that are made out of meteorites oh, oh that's pretty cool yeah that, that'd get, be good yeah. for when you're playing traveler or something I even think they did dinosaur bones too I'm almost certain of it uh, but, I don't yeah, check um, I'm, I'm almost certain of it it was either like mammoth or dinosaur bone that they did but mammoth, check out maybe, I'm just I'm just gonna disbelieve you I rolled it <laughs> I disbelieve <laughs> I disbelieve. What's my saving throw? Uh, okay, 13 or better. Roll. Yeah, okay. I, I, I disbelieve in the mammoth bone and uh, 8. Oh, well, I guess oh. I believe you. Yeah, you nope. do. <laughs> believe it or not, yeah. and you can disbelieve this, that's going to end the segment. <laughs> no. Oh, right. Creature Feature Theater. Again, by popular demand for our listeners, we're going to do some <laughs> play. Yay. Yeah, so let's try it out. Now, I don't know if I can promise everybody is a, a consistently high-quality experience or not. I'm not. I haven't taken the time to put together any sort of backstory to this uh, um, what do you call it to this encounter and in fact as we're speaking I'm quickly trying to dig up a very old dragon because there's a uh, nice critical hits and misses table that, that a little optional one that I like to keep around because it's pretty fun so I think I've got it here and because uh, hey it's always fun to get a critical hit right Yes, there. and, oh, okay, and if, this was, a, and, if this was a normal session that we were playing of course we would stop look things up and chatter, but this is all streamlined for a podcast, so we may have to just right. do things quickly, as in yeah, just be say... Ready for me to, be ready yeah. for me to uh, fudge a couple of things, but that's alright, yeah. so... Yeah. Um, just assume we have the Doritos and Mountain Dew out. Let's, yeah, exactly, right? No crunching. So, um, here we go. We're gonna start out with, uh, again, I've pulled out a couple of uh, pre-rolled characters for you, and I grabbed yep. them out of the... Uh, Judges Guild's fantastic personalities. So why don't you guys go ahead and introduce uh, who you're playing? Go ahead, Vince. All right. Uh, Jason has given me Elodin. Is that how it's pronounced? It's a... Now it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, so you you decide. Or Elodin? I don't know. Elodin, we'll call it that. Elodin sounds great. Yes, it's an elf, a fighter, magic user, chaotic good. It's 7th slash 11th level. And I have a Balrog's Bane, a famed sword of ice. Frostband plus four. Is that I guess is that intelligence? Yes, twelve. Chaotic good. Cast Ice Storm as a magic user, tenth level, once per day. Nice. He has a bunch of spells and that's just dandy. Over to you, Nick. <laughs> okay. Uh I am playing Ch Chagus the Twisted. Ooh. Uh twelfth level cleric, human. And he's chaotic good. Got some pretty good stats and uh Let's see, he's got a Mesa Disruption mm. and a Staff of the Serpent Python and Armor Class 1 and the, you know, bunch of uh, good cleric spells. So I am ready Very to cool. go as Chagos the Twisted. Chagos the Twisted. Yes. All right, so um, I'm going to place you at the uh, the mouth of a very large natural cave, very overhanging natural cave. You're, you're sort of on the side of a mountain. 
right now, but the area that you're that you've been coming up is a trail. It's late afternoon. The sun has just started to go down, okay. and um, you have you've not, you haven't been uh, in any encounters or doing any fighting today. So anything you have on your spell tables you are, are still there. You're at full hit okay. points and everything else. Um, you're approaching, so as, as you come up the path, and I don't have a backstory for you, so <laughs> listeners, fill in your own backstory. <laughs> but as you come up the path, uh, as I said, the sun's been going down, it's getting a little bit foggier as you go up, and uh, you begin to notice that the path is becoming overgrown with a, with a sort of a, uh, a, a moldy, mossy kind of uh, brown, well, it's a bright, this, you're, you, you're 10th level, you, re, you can recognize brown brown mold when you start to mm-hmm. see it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it, you haven't stepped on it, you haven't come up to it yet, but you can start to see uh, bits of it encroaching upon the trail. Mm. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're going to be heading up into this uh, natural cave, this opening. Um, before we go in, I'm going to cast Bless. Okay. So I'm going to have that going for us, and that should last, if I remember correctly, it's one round per user, so uh, per level of the user, so... Um, well, we're not going to get through 12 levels, or 12 right, rounds so, in description, so we can assume that Bless is uh, cast on you both. Right. And I'm going to count on you guys to keep track of your own um, adjustments like that. Okay, so yeah, no problem. Along. Okay. So, uh, as you're entering the cave, do you want to do anything to uh, to avoid the mold? Do you want to go go near it or anything like that? I know not to light any fires. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're not you're not novices. Okay, good. Well, first thing we're gonna do is turn around and go back to the town because we're done with this. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> so as you turn around, a giant boulder drops in front of your path, oh. keeping you from going anywhere the DM doesn't want you to go. And it says in the, on a note on it, this is a podcast. Keep it streamlined. <laughs> exactly. He thinks we should exactly. go this way, Eladin. <laughs> hmm. I can I'm gonna. I'm gonna get a closer look and see where this is all coming from. And is it going straight okay. right into the so, cave up the wall? Or well, one thing you notice as you're investigating the brown mold and you know not touching it or doing anything like that is that it's not just growing wild. It seems to have been. Uh, cultivated a bit, as, as in in other words, it's uh, it's almost as if somebody was gardening this stuff. So it's not like in random patches. So no, it seems to have actually been uh, cultivated and shaped, and it looks like some of it has. There's you can see some patches that have been clearly um, removed, as if someone or something has come along and actually harvested some of this brown uh, mold. Hmm. 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 <laughs> Interesting. What would eat brown mold? <laughs> um, people who are on a brown mold diet? Macrobiotics. Yes. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we should get a sample of this so I can study this for a little... Oh, wait. This is not a scientific game. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Wrong genre. Sorry, uh, sorry. Hmm. I think we should creep in a little bit and uh, see what else we see inside this dark cave. Yeah, I agree. The boulder I'll behind us you. prevents. I'll follow you, Elodin. Okay, oh, and yeah. be sure to tell me everything you're doing, because if you don't say it, I assume you're not doing it. I have my Mace of Disruption at the ready. Okay. I have my famed Sword of Ice at its ready. Okay, Mace and Fane. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Fane Sword? Well, anyways. Alright, uh, <laughs> you step further you step further into the cave. Uh, you remember, you're still, you're not deep in or anything. The, the mouth of the cave is still overlooking the the mountainside, and you can see out all of that, so don't worry. You're not trapped inside. But as you step inside, once you get about 15 feet into the cave, you hear a rustling and a thump, thump, thump dropping kind of sound behind you, and you turn to see that your exit has been blocked by six large creatures. They're about six feet long, quadrupeds, sort of almost insectoid looking, about six feet long and about three feet high at the shoulder with a really uh, black, slimy, 
kind of uh, skin. It almost looks like it's gangrenous. Ooh, and uh, dark midnight black eyes and a pair of exactly. sharp prongs uh, at the front. And they rush directly for you. Um, now, before we roll initiative, tell me what you're going to declare your actions before we roll, before we uh, pick the initiative. Okay. Vince, are you going to cast... Uh, are you something cast something I failed to do last time properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ca- detect uh, dancing... Li- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to prepare and cast... Uh, I'm going to try with a sleep and see if I can get some of them to be knocked out with a nice sleep okay. spell. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and uh, Chagos the Twisted. Yes. Um, trying to think if there's anything in my spell repertoire that might help on this. Uh, mm, maybe speak with animals, but they seem to be... <laughs> I don't think they want to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I think I am just going to uh, help defend the... Uh, uh, Eladin while he's casting his spell so it won't get disrupted. Okay. Right. So you'll be using your mace. Yeah, I'll be using a mace and shield and take a defensive measure so hopefully block any blows that might be coming toward towards right. Eladin. Nick, okay, you roll that, initiative. Um, roll okay. initiative. Whoever ever wants to roll it for the party, go ahead. You go ahead. All right, I'll do it this time. Yeah. Uh, five. Okay, five, and I've rolled a three, but before you make any assumptions, okay, yeah, yeah. So what I'm actually doing, I'm using segment of action. So that means that the uh, first seg, the, uh, the, the monsters that you're fighting will be beginning on the third segment, and you'll be beginning on the fifth segment. That's how we're going to be handling the initiative there. Okay. okay. So uh, this is bad news for you because... Um, I'm going to just randomly decide. Uh, low, is, odd is Chagas. Okay, so Elodin is attacked by all six at once. Wow! Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they all run. They all rush straight for you. And uh, Elodin, what is your um, armor class, please? Negative fifty. <laughs> okay. And what is your armor class in the AD and D game? Oh, I'm sorry. Two. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you were thinking of the one in your imagination. Yes, that was the wrong one. Sorry. Yes. I was thinking of my god character. That's what I was thinking of. Yes. And what is your armor class, please? Two. Two. Okay. So they're going to need an eleven to hit you, and I will give you the roll for each oh, one. Did I say oh, two? Man. I meant zero. <laughs> yes. So the first one misses you. Ha ha. Rolling a four. The second one rolls a seven and misses you. Aha. The third one hits you square on with a 16. Ow. Then a natural 20. Oh, I'm going down. Oh, And a 16. God. Oh. And a nine. So luckily only half of them hit you. Yeah. So the, the first... Uh, so the first attack, all six of them rush directly at you, charging you with their horns. So they're only getting one attack each. And um, the first one hits you for a damage of, let's see here, I've got 6 to 16 damage, so that would be D10, uh, all right, D10 plus 6, yeah, that sounds right. Um, so the first one does 3 points of damage. Okay. Okay, however... Um, in addition, you feel uh, the, your life energy drain from you as you're hit. You've just lost 1,000 experience points. Ah! Yes. Uh, now, the next one, you have just been hit with a critical hit. And so I'm going to go over to my optional little uh, bit of fun here. My, from Dragon Magazine number 39, Good Hits and Bad Misses. I will now use the critical hits chart for, uh, gosh, they don't really get a critical hit. I'm going to give them one anyways, because if I'm going to roll this, I want to have some fun with you. Ooh. So oh, I'm going to use it nice as guy. A, I, I am a nice guy. Um, I'm going to use it as a thrusting weapon. And rolling a 45 means triple damage. So in this case, we're going to... See what kind of damage you're taking on that. Where'd that D10 go? 
Ooh, ten. So that's thirty points of damage and another thousand ah. experience points. So you've now lost thirty-three hit points. And uh, how's that high-level character doing now? That, that high-level the... character is not doing too well. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll be doing a cure serious wounds on you sometime. Yeah. And the uh, third, the third hit, uh, comes in and gets you for seven plus six, so thirteen points of damage. So you've got a total of forty-six hit points of damage, and you've lost three thousand experience points. Um, now, Chagos, you Ooh, were attacked his, with. I have a quick nice. question: Is not, his uh, is his spell disrupted now? His spell is disrupted. And his spell is disrupted. Wouldn't I have to roll... This is why we roll the initiative after you declare your intentions. And wouldn't I have to roll a system shock since I've taken almost three quarters of... No, I should say 95% of my hit points there. (laughs) Well put. Yeah, Um, yeah, you do. You need to make a system shock roll. (laughs) Uh, I have a constitution of 13, so if someone could quickly look up what the... System shock is 85% or better. Ooh. Well, actually, if you actually if you roll below eighty five percent, you're you're okay. Well, now so. you're going to be rolling. Your I think your fighter is going to your the uh, fighter part of you is going to have the better saving throw, correct? So well, it's, it's based off a of constitution. No, it's based off a of constitution. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, go ahead. You and, roll, uh, roll below eighty five percent. Uh oh! First number is an eight. Oh no. <laughs> 89. I'm down for the oh, count. Oh. Can he get a mulligan? A hard no. first hit. That is a hard first hit. A critical hit, and you failed your system shock. Oh, I'm so down. He's unconscious. I'm unconscious. Unconscious. Okay, so, uh, Chagos, it's down to you. You've got six of these creatures who have all piled on your friend, and I you surrender. are attacking with a mace. However, it is a mace of disruption. Yeah, but they're not undead. <laughs> At least I don't think it they did are. It just drain 3,000 experience points. All right. Well, you know what? All right. I'll swing at the nearest one. Okay. So you are going to hit against an armor class of four. That means you've got to get... Let's level find player. This here. You've got to get a 10. That's not bad. I rolled an 18. Nice. Okay. Um, and give me your damage on that Mesa Disruption. I think it was... What do I roll? Uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's a D6 plus one. Or so D6, D6 plus two. Sorry. Uh, it's a D... Yeah, it's D6 plus one. Uh, okay. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them seems to notice that he's actually been tapped on the shoulder by you. Yeah. So that's good news. And obviously <laughs> he's... Yeah, so... Okay, so as we enter into the next round of combat, please declare your intentions. Chagos only. Okay, well. I play uh, dead. Let's see. Yeah, you lay there like a <laughs> I've slug. Gotta keep, I've got to keep this a little bit. You did not turn it. You did not go unconscious. That was, I mean, yes, you did, but this, that's going to ruin this point. So, uh, Eladin, you are not unconscious. You actually rolled a 40, not an 88 or whatever. <laughs> Ha ha! Oh, we're fudging. We're fudging. We're gonna hear about it. You yeah, know it. You know we're gonna oh, get you. fudging. <laughs> I love fudge. It's tasty. So, uh, Chagas, what will you do in this round? Uh, let me see here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, he's close to me. How can I? So he's not um, out. Uh, Eladin's not out. No, no. No, uh, he's he's still on his feet. Okay. He has been hit hard, but he's still on his feet. Can we? Um... No, I can't. I can't move and cast. Never mind. Shoot, because I got the perfect spell that will protect us. You're right next. Oh well, yeah, that's true. You're yeah, right but next. Now to me. they're close within melee. At least we yeah. can cut some of them off. Mm. Okay, I'll now do they it. Basically, <clears throat> what they've done is uh, surrounded. Um, they've surrounded Eladin, and they're just kind of piling on. It's like it's like a horrible football scrum, a rugby scrum or something. Oh, okay, it's, it's I not, see. It's, it's, not, it's not pretty. Okay, so, yeah, I wouldn't cast this spell. And Damn, I should have cast it earlier. Um, um, well, you know what? Um, I think I'm going to do... Uh, 
<laughs> he needs some healing badly, so I think I'm going to do a cure serious wounds on him. Help me. Yeah. Interesting. May I just suggest? <laughs> no. Okay. <that laughs> The uh, cure serious wounds that you do also prevents you from attacking any of these. Uh, well, it's either that uh, or he we dies. Are, we are, he may well die, but we also are trying to illustrate what these uh, monsters can and cannot handle. When you okay, attack. I will attack the same one as I did before. <laughs> with anything particular? With anything, yes. With, I think, the Mace of Disruption again. I might point out that the Mace of Disruption does not seem to have had the effect one would expect How about the st- undead. <laughs> How about the Staff of the Serpent? <gasps> Excellent. So yeah. what will be, So you will do what with your Staff of the Serpent? You have a couple uh, of options. You can drop yeah. it and do a python? I think, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to have it okay. become the Constrictor Snake. Okay, so you're going to python it up. All right. And Elodin. Eladin is going to take his sword that he can barely hold in his hand at this point, mm-hmm. and he's going to attack the nearest one to him as possible and hack it into a million pieces. Okay. Uh, will you use any of your special powers of your sword? He will use the frost brand. You'll use the frost brand, uh, meaning what? Would you want to use the cone of uh, cold or what? I forgot what it was exactly. It just says frost brand, so I assume it's some type of cold. Uh, you have the power to once per day um, cast an ice storm. Lost. Ice storm. There you go. Yeah. Okay. This is what brings up a quick question: Will this cast yes. an ice storm inside of a cave? Because we're not outside. Uh, yeah. This will. All right, I'm so just then... going to go ahead and I'm for the purposes of what we're doing right now. I'm going to say yes, it will. I'm going to let you make the attack and have ice storm be combined with the attack. All right, I stick my sword up in the air like He-Man, and I call upon the ice storm gods to rain ice and shards down upon these creatures. Rain down icy death on these little buggers. Rain down icy death. Now let's uh, roll initiative for this round. Nick, you go since I did bad last time. I rolled a five. I rolled a a two. Neater, neater, neater. Excellent. So you actually have the drop on them this go round. (laughs) <laughs> That's nice to know. So, Chagos, you drop the uh, python, the staff of uh, the serpent to the ground, and it I turns do my Charlton six- Heston bit from the Ten Commandments and throw down my staff. <laughs> Changing from a six-foot staff into a 25-foot python, it goes out and wraps itself around the first of these creatures and gets it into a vice-like death grip. I think I actually better roll the hit on that just to uh, make sure it's actually uh... doing so. And um, actually, I rolled for you. Sorry, I was thinking about it. Yeah, no problem. If you're interested, I rolled an 18. (laughs) Cool. Do you want it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Okay, so the the first of these bizarre creatures is entangled in the serpent. And he is unable to do anything at this point. Uh-huh. Elodin, you hold your sword into the air, calling forth the mighty power of an ice storm, which rains down upon everything in the cave, both of you included, of course. Yes, I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you, even in the midst of the melee and the, and the chaos and the fighting going on, are somewhat surprised to see that it seems to affect them absolutely massively, not one bit. What the deuce? Not a single, not a single bit of damage has been done as a result of the ice storm that has come down upon them. Uh, let's actually see what does the ice storm do. Uh, All right. To have the Elodin takes this. this is, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You no, know, no. Go ahead. I was going to say Elodin takes this opportunity to crap in his pants at this point because he's doing <laughs> nothing to them. You'll now. have to roll for that. I'm afraid. Oh, um, darn. <laughs> So, you know what, I don't actually, I'd have to flip through to grab the ice storm here quickly. And again, like you were saying, if we were playing this uh, in-game, we'd have everything uh, on the spot and accurate. But let's, uh, let's not even worry about that right now, because the attacks are still going against Elodin at this point. And what is actually happening, I probably um, just flubbed this one a little bit, because here they actually get... Uh, three attacks in this round, which means that I think one of them would have naturally come first. You want me to roll the damage on the ice storm? I got it right here. Yeah, why don't you roll that while I'm pulling up their... It's 3d10. 
Hey, the ice storm yeah. magically kills you dead forever. No, let's ah. <laughs> we'll let them get their hits. <laughs> okay, you know, honestly, the my, the ice storm would have pretty much just taken Elodin out. <laughs> yes, the ice storm has just killed yeah. me. And I, okay. yeah, I just. Unless and Nick rolls 16 three. Points. 16 points. Oh, okay. Well, here's, here's the good news. Um, because all of these creatures were piling on Elodin, um, they won't be doing any more damage this round. Because they, all, all their damage is going towards uh, Elodin, who now lies. Uh, you shouldn't have very, worn that red shirt. Very, you shouldn't have wore the red tunic today. I, I, I couldn't help it. It was a really sexy color, and it went well with my eyes. And Oh, sorry. <laughs> Chagas, uh, we are in what I believe with some Ch uh, with some uh, uh, credibility to be possibly our last round in this encounter. So okay. what will you do run. with the six? Yes, what will you do? Run, 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 run. I cast Blade Berry around me. Excellent. Uh -huh. <laughs> Excellent. Um, roll See initiative. if they can get through that. Roll initiative, please. I rolled a two again. Ooh. I'm, I'm going to have to actually send you a photograph of this to prove it. You rolled a one. Rolled a one. <laughs> Wait a minute. I did cast Bless. Doesn't that also give me a plus one to my initiatives, or is that just a hit? Oh, does it? Then we have a tie. Excellent. So then it comes down to um, what is the casting time on Blade Barrier? Casting time on Blade Barrier. Oh, my goodness. How many segments? Instant. All right. I'm, <laughs> I wish... Um, oh my god. <laughs> what is it? Nine segments. Nine segments. So you would be uh, actually using up this entire round to cast that. All Your initiative essentially doesn't matter at all. Um, yes, you are piled upon. And just for fun, I'm going to go ahead and roll. What's your, what's your armor class? Let's see if they might all what? miss. That's pretty what? good. That is pretty good. They're actually going to need to roll 12s just to hit you, so okay. uh, that's a 13 so yeah. that's a hit one hit that's a 7 no yes. a 1, a critical fumble yay Fumbaruski. Fumbalaya. Fumbaruski. 3 more to go, that's a 19 that's a hit Ooh. that's a 9, that's a miss Ooh. and that's an 8, so not too bad. The first one hits you. Uh, hits you for. Let's see here. Uh, actually, you know what? I've got to roll a whole bunch of these because they're getting three attacks in on you, and all the attacks are going to come in on this round because with the nine segment casting time Wait. and your action beginning on the second segment, you won't really be able to get your spell off till the very end. Roll the so. fumble first to see if that one interrupts the rest of them. Yeah, let's give it a shot. So, uh, rolling the critical fumble, going back to the tables here. We have, come on, critical fumbles, where are you? All right. Do you guys want to roll the fumble for him? Yeah, what's the, uh, yeah, is there uh, like a percentage percentile. roll? Per percentile. Yeah, okay. I'll roll it. Okay. Uh, 85. 85 means he hits his friend for double damage. Ha ha. <laughs> so I will roll uh, one through six to see which one he hits. He hits the fourth one, which luckily for you is one of the ones that actually uh, was coming after you. And uh, uh, so hitting, hitting his friend, he ends up getting all... Th uh, you know what? I'm just going to let these uh, attack rolls that we just did count for all three of their attacks. I would normally okay. cut this out a little bit longer, but it's more fun for him to fumble all three of his attacks, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah. he's got a claw, claw, bite routine. So he claws first and hits his friend... Um, Oh, I'm not, what am I doing? I was rolling it to hit to see if he was going to hit him. Yes, he hits him because that was part of the fumble. So he hits his friend for... Uh, how many points of damage do we have here? Just a moment. For 14 points of damage. And he's still wow. up. The next claw attack gets him for... Uh, nine points of damage. So 14 was a 23. And the next claw attack gets him for, ooh, 16 points of damage. Uh -huh. So that would be 39 points of damage, and he's actually just killed his companion. Nice. Yay! So that wasn't too good. Okay, so we've got the one hit that's coming on you that did manage to succeed, and we hit you for uh, 15 points of damage with the first claw attack. And by the way, you just lost 1,000 experience points. 
And uh, then also uh, 13 points of damage with the next claw attack, which uh, did manage to take away another 1,000 experience points from you. So I had and 13 finally, for the second, and what was the first one? How many points? Uh, what did I say, 15? Let's say 15. 15? I'm dead. Oh, that's too bad because there was one more hit that landed on you. Oh, wait a minute. I got, I got nine left. <laughs> oh, okay. There's one more hit that landed on you uh, doing three points of damage. Ah, and, uh, oh, God. I'm at six and uh, another thousand experience points. And let's go ahead and call it there. Okay. Uh, because... <laughs> oh, I want my blade barrier going off. Oh, well, your blade barrier wouldn't. There, your spell was interrupted. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's I mean, you, it takes nine segments to do it, and during those nine segments, you were being viciously clawed and bitten, so I don't think your spell would go off. Pummel. Okay. okay. I have no idea what these things are. You got me. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> you have just encountered the Colful. 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 C O L F E L. The Colful. The Colful was uh, created by Richard Lucas back in December of 1981 for Dragon Magazine, oh. and I don't think, <laughs> and I don't think the Colful ever appeared in in any of the books. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't remember it ever showing up. Which I don't know why, because I really dig these guys. So let me tell oh, you. Oh yeah, a little it's about really the Colful. fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the Colful. He planned uh, to the kill Colful us. The Colful is a, a, a native <laughs> of the negative material plane, which is why you were getting hit with uh, energy drain every time. So it's similar to an undead by having the energy drain, but it's not for the same reasons. Oh, um, like you saw, they're uh, large, sort of insectoid-looking things, but you know, six feet long, three feet high at the shoulder, uh, very. You know, gross, slimy, black skin, like gangrenous flesh, and these sort of pinchers on the front like a roach. Um, they, it says here that they've only recently been appearing on the prime material plane, probably due to summonings by powerful magicians desiring greater and more powerful servants. Hmm. Um, they usually attack first by uh, charging into a melee and spearing with their horns, and the second and subsequent attacks are claw-claw bite routines. They are immune, so they're, they're several attributes similar to the greater undead. They are immune to cold or ice attack, ice based attacks of any form. Okay. Um, however, um, it's kind of funny that you mentioned you were making fun of the, I think it was, uh, what was one of your light spells? It wasn't Continual Light, it dancing was. Dancing Lights. Dancing Lights would have actually been a pretty good thing to use because. Of their weaknesses, their weaknesses are also related to the fact that they're from the negative material plane. You will light. never see them out in direct sunlight, and they suffer damage directly from any type of light that you use, whether it's a oh, torch. Man. Um, you, yeah, I gave you a lot of light spells in your characters there. Um, light will do three hit points of damage. Continual light will do an ongoing six hit points of damage. Um, pyrotechnics in the fireworks form will do 12 hit points of damage dancing lights will do 1d4 color spray will do 2d8 um, prismatic spray is badass on these guys it's a 4d6 against them um, a wand of illumination you basically gotten rid of one because 66 because these guys only have um, 7 hit dice so but the reason that they can be so vicious is that one of their preferred ways to attack is to gang up on a single member of the party all on just all pile on yeah so that, that was be, obvious uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's a uh, um and one of the one of the ways that you will know when a colful is near is that they consider brown mold to be an excellent source of food and so if they find a pet they're very they're actually of um high intelligence so they will wow. they will nurture the brown mold and actually you know use it as a uh, a source of food that they will grow so i could have just cast my light spell and that would have been doing what like six points of damage around if you had thought we're going into a dark cave perhaps we should see what's in here first and cast some light into the cave you would have you would have had the drop on them so i was stupid <laughs> no, you just didn't know you were going up against Colful. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> well, that's a cool monster. We have to post that it up for people cool. to see. Wow. That yeah. is really neat. I want to use that. <laughs> yes. uh, you know what? I think uh, 
I think we can post this thing. We'll see if anybody comes after us for just putting the I stats up. I don't think they. No, I don't think they. If it's just for stat purposing, and I don't think yeah. people from Dragon Magazine are going to come after us for something from 30 yeah. years ago. So. Yeah, and by the way, <laughs> Richard Lucas created this. I'm not really familiar with him as a writer, so if uh, anybody knows other stuff Richard Lucas has done, or if if you know Richard Lucas, or you are Richard thanks. Lucas, or if you are Richard of George, Lucas, <laughs> um, uh, then you know, thanks for making such a cool monster. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And people out there in listening land, RFI Nation, as we're calling them now, uh, if you want to hear more actual play like this every podcast, feedback, feedback, feedback. This is a result of feedback, so. <laughs> you know, okay, this is just an idea, and I haven't asked you guys about this, but maybe uh, we could invite, if anybody has a pretty, wants to try to stump us with a cool creature and would like to come on and uh walk us through something like this that might be an interesting uh, little guest segment to have yeah sure I like you know, it so, yeah I think that That's might cool. be kind of fun that would be cool yeah so uh, anybody who's listening if you think that you've got a cool monster that you'd like to uh, run through an encounter why don't you uh, drop us a voicemail or something because honestly we need to hear if you know if, if how you sound and everything but uh, you know we'll give it some thought and yeah. what Jason actually means by how you sound is your audio quality. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't yeah. mean by how your voice sounds. <laughs> yeah, oh. I think that's what you should have said. But... Yeah, well, you fixed it for me, so that's yeah, all right. that's fine. Yeah. Well, that's gonna put a wrap on the show tonight. You know, nail a hammer or nail into the coffin. We'll hammer that one in, and we'll say good night to everybody. And uh, DM Vince signing off for the cast. Saying keep it original, keep it old school, and uh, keep leaving us feedback, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Roll for initiative.